racism impacts our patients. One of the other major reasons that I kept on coming back to this topic was that the amount of diversity and inclusion that we see at Kings County is really unique and special. Um, at this institution, there are people of color that occupy every space of, of power, of, um, you know, whether it's physicians, whether it's residents, whether it's staff or patients, we, know, we all reflect each other. And I think it's an incredible, powerful, incredibly powerful experience and one that not many residency programs get to experience and not one that many people get to experience, really. So moving forward, I hope to take some of the lessons uh, that I learned at County regarding diversity and the importance of inclusion and also the importance of understanding um, health disparities with me as we go forward. And hopefully I can convey some of those lessons to you. And as we transition into different roles and different um, institutions, we can take some of those lessons with us. So my, here's a quick outline of my senior lecture. And this is a candid <laughs> shot of me putting my lecture together. Uh, we're gonna comb, comb over some of the basic principles around uh, the theory of, uh, theories and uh, frameworks of racism. I'm going to be putting in uh, some historical perspectives, tie in uh, how that impacts us today, and tease out what structural racism is and how it works. I'm going to spend some time defining racism, um, what it means for healthcare providers, and more importantly for our patients. And then we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about implicit bias and how this affects our decision making as, uh, as physicians. And lastly, I hope to leave you with some lessons about how to um, change our own behaviors and impact the institutions that we work for um, in terms of uh, disparities. So I know we all want to believe that we're healthcare providers, we're blind to race, we treat everybody equally, um, but there's a lot of evidence that that really isn't the case. And I think some, most of us here can understand that. So before we start, and before we get too deep into it, I just do want to acknowledge that this topic is not easy to talk about, and it's not easy to listen to. Um, a lot of us in this room have probably experienced racism or have family members who have been victims of racism. Some of us you know, may come from homes or communities where racism is acceptable or is a part of our, our upbringing. And for some of us, both of those things might be true. So I just want to set the set of groundwork so that we're all kind of on the same page and um, just acknowledge really that I think we can all agree that racism exists whether it's Char Charlottesville or Jim Crow laws in the past or mass incarceration, um, we have to acknowledge that racism is a fundamental part of American society. And second, I, I really want to drive home this point that racism serves a point, uh, sorry, uh, a purpose in our culture. And it, its purpose is to maintain existing power structures. And I don't really think we have to look too deep to see that poverty, homelessness, access to health care and education disproportionately affect black and brown people in our society. So what I'll argue is that racism serves to differentially or preferentially provide access to resources to one group versus another. And lastly, I just want to make sure that we understand that racism is a social construct and not a biological one. And um, so those are the, the main tenets of what I'll be talking about. I'll be using a theory called uh, critical race theory to address some of these topics. And critical, critical race theory comes out of law schools in the 1980s that were trying to look at how society, culture, power, and race all interplay and uh, give us what we see today. One of the leaders of this field is uh, Dr. Tamara uh, Phyllis Jones. Uh, she's a senior fellow and adjunct professor, professor at Morehouse, and she's certified in family um, medicine. She's board certified in family medicine. And so she uses allegory to explain how racism works in our society and how it impacts people's health. And um, she has this really beautiful allegory called the Gardner's Tale. And in it, she talks about three levels of racism, institutional, personally mediated, and internalized. So institutional racism is racism, racism at a systems level. It's access to goods, services, opportunities, and how that access differs by race. For example, how the lack of access to housing, education, employment, and healthcare can disadvantage one group compared to another. And this explains some of the presumed links that we see uh, people make when they talk about race and socioeconomic status. 
So when someone says, you know, the connect, there's a connection uh, between minorities and being poor, or minorities and not getting a college degree, often what is what ha what's happening there is that they're lacking um, an acknowledgement that equal access to resources really has a huge play to role, in, uh, a huge role to play in that. Personally mediated re uh, racism is probably the one where most uh, we can identify most easily. And it's usually what we think of when we think of racism. It's kind of the present prejudice, discrimination, and it results from the beliefs that um, aptitude and abilities are dictated by race. And so one important note I want to make here is that uh, you don't necessarily need intent um, for this to occur. You don't have to intentionally want your behaviors or actions to disproportionately affect a group for it to be racism. Um, and I'll come back to this in a bit, uh, but it's important in how our biases play in the clinical setting when we differentially allocate pain medications or the extent of a workup or compassion when we are dealing with our patients. Internalized racism, and I'm sorry if the man's here is going to about this. So internalized racism um, is the acceptance of stigmatized um, messages or negative beliefs about one's own culture that are um, kind of predominantly put out there. So it involves embracing negative stereotypes about oneself or often, you know, cultural uh, ideas of beauty and um, also plays into this idea of imposter syndrome that some of us have been may, may be familiar with. The idea that um, as brown providers or people of color from different backgrounds aren't traditionally known to be in medicine, um, we feel out of place because we don't believe that we belong there for whatever reason. So I want to go back to this idea about um, instructional racism and what it means in the U.S. Um, so in 1965, the United, States, the United Nations adopted a convention that uh, was called the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Dis Discrimination. And it was set up basically to do that, to eliminate racial discrimination against its, uh, amongst its member states. And in 2008, it put out a in-depth analysis of how the U.S. was doing in regards to institutional racism. And you can kind of guess what it found. Um, first, it called out the U.S. in, in saying that it really wasn't holding up um, its end of the bargain in terms of combating institutional racism and was actually moving backwards over time um, and striking things down like affirmative action or voting rights act or um, failing to address <coughs> income inequality and access to resources. Second, it outlined um, some very um, unique things in the Constitution and in US law in particular that allowed this to happen. So bear in mind, I'm, not a legal scholar, but I've done some research into this, and I, I want to explain a little bit more about this. So the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, um, its clause in that um, amendment establishes equal protection. Um, it ensures that the same rights and privileges protection, and protections are afforded to all the US citizens. Um, and it was really in instrumental in arguing uh, Brown versus Board of Education, which struck down school segregation. But over the years and since that um, landmark case, um, in the 70s, the Supreme Court found that you know you don't the, you could you're allowed the government is allowed to um, enact discriminatory laws at law, as as long as it does so unintentionally. So what this means is that you have to prove in order to prove that the government is discriminating against you, whether it's for race or gender or sexuality, you have to do you have to prove that it's doing so intentionally. So. It's really hard to prove intent in court, as we've seen with the obstruction of justice um, case against President Trump. And not only is it really hard to prove intent, it fails to acknowledge that a law or policy can be racist without setting out to be racist. And so rather than go too much uh, deeper into um, that, I'd like to give you some examples of how this plays out. So in terms of education, um, there's a case, San Antonio versus Rodriguez, and so I'm not sure how many of you guys know this, but public school, public schools in the United States are funded by uh, local property taxes. Uh, so what this means is that poorer schools get less funding um, and richer schools get more funding. So in 1973, a uh, parents um, advocacy group uh, took San Antonio School District to court, saying that this funding structure um, 
violated their children's equal protections um, under the 14th Amendment. And essentially, parents are saying, you know, our kids are largely brown and minority kids, and they're not getting the same advantages as our neighbors who live in predominantly white, affluent neighborhoods. Um, and the Supreme Court found against the patient, uh, sorry, the uh, parents, said that equal access to education wasn't guaranteed under the Constitution, and therefore equal access to access to it was also not guaranteed. And it also found that because the parents couldn't prove that the funding structure, namely local tax laws, weren't set out in name to be racist or discriminatory, that they, had, they didn't have a case. And so this uh, precedent set forward you know, a lot of the inequality that we see in our public, health, uh, public school system and you know, has really limited for a lot of people, access to what that ed uh, access to things that access to things that that education provides, like uh, access to college, better paying jobs, and social mobility. Uh, the second example I'll give uh, refers to housing in the U.S. Um, so the homeowners association and the federal housing authority were governmental agencies that were, were responsible for um, insuring home loans. Um, up until the 1950s, these guys were federal agencies, and they had explicit um, law, um, written protocols that prohibited banks from lending to black and brown um, individuals. They said minorities bring down property value, so and they instructed banks not to lend to them, or they wouldn't insure those loans. Um, and while, like, up until the 50s, well, in the 50s, those were struck down from uh, the federal authorities. Up until the 70s, local community, uh, local community banks and cities would still use these practices in deciding who could get a home loan. So you might think, like, well, that was in the 70s. How does that have an impact on what we, what's going on now? But it turns out home ownership is a really big deal, and not just for the people who own the home and get to live in it, but for future generations. So um, we have to ask ourselves, you know, who was buying houses in 1950s, 60s, and 70s, being potentially turned away from getting a, a home loan? And for many of us, it's our grandparents and our parents. And so, if you were a white person trying to get a house back in the 50s, 60s, or 70s, you're mo more likely to get a home loan. And not necessarily because your home loan officer was a racist, but because it was dictated to them by federal authorities that they could not give you a loan. And so, as you flash forward and you look at how property values increase and how communities were able to use that money to buy second homes, reinvest in um, themselves, get college educations, um, reinvest in retirement, and grow their wealth, communities of color were kept out of these uh, opportunities and were stuck renting in poor neighborhoods with low access to um, education, health care, um, and I think we have to ask ourselves, you know, if how many more people of color would we have seen in our universities, in our medical school educations, if their grandparents and parents had had the same access to wealth that white communities did? So these, I just want to make the point that these policies have real impact. Um, they're still around. Um, I was just listening to a piece on NPR the other day about how zoning laws in Connecticut had made it one of the most um, segregated and highest in terms of income inequality in the country. They won't let higher density move in, and what that translates to is people of lower means and typically people of color can't move in to affluent neighborhoods to get access to those resources. So it's still alive and well today. And you know, the list goes on and on uh, when you talk about criminal justice and the war on drugs or police brutality or voter suppression and it just keeps going on and on. And I won't, I can't provide an endless list of statistics, but I won't, because some of you guys are starting to look like these guys. And, <laughs> and so because I really want to talk about how institutional racism plays in the healthcare. I found this video running through this. this is the clip. Yeah. So I'm just going to show a clip of this video because it really demonstrates some of the history of how racism plays in healthcare. And it does so a million times better than I could. <laughs> 
this is a, a video by ProPublica and Vox, and it kind of documents um, some key, some of the key history in, in U.S. healthcare. created the vaginal speculum, an instrument gynecologists use for examination. He pioneered the surgical repair for fistula, a complication from childbirth, and became known as the father of modern gynecology. But that brilliant achievement was the result of a series of excruciating experimental surgeries that he conducted on enslaved women. In a lot of ways, Sims epitomizes the story of American medicine for black women. It's a system that's failing them to this day. From infant mortality to life expectancy, the racial disparities in healthcare are staggering. The gulf between black and white might be widest when we look at maternal mortality, with black women three to four times more likely to die in connection with pregnancy or birth than white women. And that divide can be traced back to doctors like Sims who contributed to a long, largely overlooked history of institutional racism in medicine. Trying to understand a historical problem without knowing its history is like trying to treat a patient without eliciting a thorough medical history. You're doomed to failure. That's Gary Washington, a medical ethicist and author who chronicled the intersection of race and medicine in her book, Medical Apartheid. While many of the stark racial disparities in healthcare can be attributed to environmental and economic factors like access to good healthcare, studies show that minority patients tend to receive a lower quality of care than non-minorities, even when they have the same types of health insurance or the same ability to pay for care. As African Americans, we've been abused for so long consistently by the system, why should we trust it? Why should we go to one ill? And that's eotrophobia. That's a fear of the healer. You know, inculcated by behavior those here healers, unfortunately. It starts with slavery. Doctors relied on slave owners for financial stability. They accompanied plantation masters to auctions to verify the fitness of slaves and were called in to treat sick slaves to protect their owners' investments. In 1807, Congress abolished the importation of slaves and in turn pushed black women to have more children to essentially breed slaves. Founding father Thomas Jefferson later wrote, I consider a woman who brings a child every two years as more profitable than the best man on the farm. Around the 1830s, the abolitionist movement led to the rise of what was called Negro medicine, or efforts to identify black inferiority to justify slavery. And there were polygenists who tried to use both science and the Bible to find proof that races evolved from different origins. The 1830s also marked the beginning of recorded experimentation on black women's bodies. One doctor performed experimental C-sections on slaves. Another one perfected the dangerous ovariotomy, or removal of an ovary by testing the procedure on slave women. In fact, half the original articles in the 1836 Southern Medical and Surgical Journal dealt with experiments on black people. And then, of course, there is James Marion Sims, whose reputation is etched in history and on that statue in Central Park. Between 1845 and 1849, Sims began performing experimental surgeries on a 17-year-old slave named Anarka. He eventually performed 30 operations on Anarka, 
and more surgeries on about 11 other female slaves. When his male colleagues could no longer bear to assist him in inflicting pain on the women, the slaves took turns restraining one another. Yet paintings depicting Sims, Anarka, and other slave women presented a subdued version of his experiments. Even though anesthesia was introduced in 1846, Sims chose not to use it for his experimentation with slaves. His practices echoed one of the most prevalent and dangerous beliefs in medicine at the time, that black people did not feel pain or anxiety. This book from 1851, titled The Natural History of Human Species, claimed the American dark races bear with indifference, tortures insupportable to a white man. So just stop there. The video goes on to document how throughout the rest of the 20th century, um, different experiments like the Tuskegee experiment or sterilization um, against women's consent took place in the South and other parts of the United States. Um, I just want to show this video because it, I think it really eloquently shows how deep racism is entrenched in, in medicine and how few of us, I mean, had anybody heard some of these things before or been taught about it in medical school? Yeah, I mean, so I think it's really important. It's part of our history, and we should you know, um, really understand that. So, oh my God, this so I want to go forward now and talk about how we understand how racial disparities in healthcare exist today. Um, and one thing I'll use is a report by the Institute of Medicine that was done in 1999. Um, Congress asked the Institute to uh, look at racial disparities, how, how they exist in healthcare. Uh, they were asked to um, kind of find out why, uh, if healthcare disparities existed across race um, that weren't attributable, attributable to factors such as access to healthcare, ability to pay, and insurance coverage, among other factors. Uh, they were asked to evaluate potential uh, sources of racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare and the role of bias, discrimination, and stereotyping both at the individual patient provider level and the systems level. And lastly, they were asked to make recommendations about how to intervene to counteract these disparities. So what they found is much of what um, many of us know. Uh, they found that African Americans die from nearly every, every major disease at rates higher than whites, 5.7 um, times higher in homicide, 8.7 times higher in HIV. And even in the top three causes of death, they were the same for blacks and whites, but by far, um, black, black people died at striking, strikingly higher rates. 30% higher for heart disease, 30% higher for cancer, 40% higher for stroke. And like the video talked about, more recent, more recent research has shown that African American women are three to four more times like, more likely to die during pregnancy than whites, and that infant mortality is twice as high in African American communities compared to whites. Um, they also found that minority communities are disproportionately more likely than the general population to be uninsured and overrepresented in, the, in those publicly funded health systems. And even when they do have the same health insurance and similar access to providers as non-minorities, minorities still tend to, to receive a lower quality of care than whites. For example, African Americans are more likely than whites to receive less desirable services such as amputations also found that Hispanic patients were more likely to receive nasogastric tubes compared to their white counterparts. And these disparities exist even uh, when they controlled for things like stage of disease, comorbidities, and disease severity. And these disparities exist across practice settings. So they exist in public and private hospitals and teaching and non-teaching hospitals. The report also found that there are some factors that contribute <coughs> to disparities that were institutional. But things like cultural and linguistic barriers, so like lack of interpretational services or culture, like culturally appropriate health information. They found that the fragment, fragmentation of our healthcare system negatively impacts, impacts these communities. So like access to um, prior med medical records or difficulty getting follow-up for our patients. And um, there's also factors that relate to um, where minorities get their care. So. As I mentioned, even when they have the same health insurance, um, they tend to get care in public hospitals. So I think this is important to consider because it impacts our patients. And you know, we work at a safety net hospital where we serve predominantly um, 
minority and people of color. And we see on a daily basis how the access to resources that we have that we can provide our students. <coughs> when we compare an institution like uh, Lutheran to county and the access to social work and just the depth of services that we can provide to our services in those two settings and who, what population we're serving is really, I don't know, it's eye-opening for me and I think it's something that we should think about. And so I don't have, you know, time today to talk about why our health system is this way, but I think it's, in, it's worth taking a look at some of the arguments about why we haven't established a universal health care system or expanded Medicaid. Because I think some of those discussions will reverberate with some of the things that we we'll talked to talk about today. Um, the Institute uh, of Medicine also found in their, their report that there are key factors that are within the patient-provider interaction that played an important role in perpetuating uh, racial disparities. And these included provider bias or prejudice against minorities, clinical uncertainty in interacting with minority patients, and beliefs and stereotypes held by providers about the behavior and health of, min of minorities. So before I delve too much deeper into the research that kind of explains some of this bias, um, I wanted to take a step back and talk about personal imme personally medi mediated racism as it relates to implicit bias. I find the, found this quote, quote uh, by Voltaire, and I think it spoke to me. It says um, that the mind is an exceptional capacity for finding reasons to believe whatever that it wants to believe. And I think we can relate to this in medicine, whether it's we anchoring when we anchor on a diagnosis passed on at sign out, or whether it's when we see the sickle cell <coughs> patient in hallway three and we tag them as drug seeking. I think we have to confront these biases as providers, or we risk becoming ineffective. Um, and by exploring these in ourselves, I think we have a potential for making better interactions with our patients and being better decision makers. So interestingly, a lot of the research that's come out of bias in medicine uh, has come out of the ED. Um, the first studies we looked at um, distribution of analgesia and it's expanded out from there. Everything from uh, cardiac cath to treatment of renal disease to diabetes to mammography, um, all of these things have uh, been shown to be linked to physician bias. So one of the first studies that was done that looked at this was done at uh, UCLA in 1993 in their ED. It looked at whether Hispanic patients with long bone fractures were more were as likely as their, as their white counterparts to receive pay, uh, pain medication. I found that Hispanic patients with long bone fractures were twice as likely as non-Hispanic white patients to uh, receive pain medication. Even when you controlled for ethnicity, sex, primary language, insurance, and a bunch of other variables. Um, Hispanic ethnicity was the strongest predictor of not receiving pain meds. Another study in the, in the ED um, looked at physician bias as it related to treating patients suspected of having ACS. This uh, study was unique because it looked at chest pain managed just in the ED. And the results were pretty striking. They showed that of patients diagnosed with acute MI in the ED, 60% um, of white patients received cardiac cath as opposed to only about 40% of African Americans and 36% of other non-white patients. It, additionally, it showed that patients diagnosed with NSTEMI um, or unstable angina, um, well, patients were more likely, be, uh, so in white patients who were diagnosed with NSTEMI and unstable angina, they were more likely than their the minority counterparts to get cardiac cath. It also showed that minority patients were significantly more likely to get diagnosed with non-ACS chest pain, despite getting fewer tests, getting less therapy, and having fewer, fewer hospitalizations than their white counterparts. So almost across the board, all of the data um, on this topic shows that um, when you talk about acute MI or unstable antigen, <coughs> African American patients are significantly less likely to, likely to receive the same standard of care as uh, their white counterparts and similar disparities exist in Hispanic populations. Um, more recent studies show that for those who do receive uh, thrombolytics or PCI, door to therapy times are significantly longer for these patients as well. So um, these studies kind of give us an idea uh, that racial bias is happening in the clinical setting and it's impacting our patients' ability to access healthcare, their ability of minorities to ac access appropriate care and their ability to have outcomes that are comparable to their white peers. And so 
well, I'm, this isn't meant to be an exhaustive list of all the ways that healthcare treats minorities differently. Um, it's hopefully um, a way for me to show that institutional, raci institutional racism exists and impl implicit bias um, has a role to play in, in, in what we do. Um, a special note about the ED, um, a study done in the ED, particularly looking at racial bias, showed that the environment that we're in, the high fatigue, the work overload, and the time pressure um, put a lot of strain on us, and we're less likely to be able to combat those biases when we're in the emergency department under that much stress. So I think this is particularly relevant to us when we're working 12 hour shifts or back to back shifts and we have eating, we you know, have taking care of ourselves. Um, we start operating on idle, autopilot and some of those biases creep in. So forward action, what, what can we do about uh, racial bias and um, implicit bias? So I think we have to commit to recognizing that the experiences of our patients and colleagues are different and we have to take those differences in to historical and political context. We have to confront our own biases and understand how they affect our clinical decision making. And we have to strive to deliver care that's equitable, as equitable as possible. Uh, we have to eliminate healthcare disparities within our hospital systems wherever we end up working. And we have to promote a diverse workforce um, at every level, whether it's undergraduate or med school or residency and beyond. Because I think this diverse workforce, it's a diverse workforce that helps us develop the sensitivities that we need to be able to interact with our patients in um, the least biased way as possible. And I'll say here that this is one of the things that I'm most proud of having graduated from Kings County. Because I think this is one of the few places um, that we'll see that level of diversity at every level. And um, I think it's a really special thing. And I hope as we move forward and take leadership positions at other institutions, We'll, incur, we'll be encouraged to advocate for more education on racism, diversity, and inclusion as part of medical education and resident training. So in summary, I hope I've convinced you that institutional racism and implicit bias exists, that it impacts our patients and their patients' health in meaningful ways, and that we have a personal responsibility to address the inequalities that face our patients. And as one final last note, I just want to say how grateful I am to all the faculty, the residents, the staff, and especially the patients for help me, helping me survive these four years. Um, it's been insane. But I'm, I think I'm a stronger, more compassionate, and more capable physician for having experienced them. So thank you. or comments that anybody would like to make, obviously we are open to that. That was wonderful. Um, I think that oftentimes we think that we live in a bubble of Brooklyn and that of course we're not racist because most of our patients are like 99% coming from the African diaspora. That is absolutely not true and it's not the intent but we do perpetuate um, institutional racism and, and we, we've all done it even if we are the same color of our patients. So, you know, we had an m and two years ago of a 400 pound African American woman who came to us maybe two or three times complaining of abdominal pain, got morphine at one point. Um, and the last time she came, she made a huge scene, threw herself on the floor, and we called security test to escort her out. And someone finally realized she lost her pulse. She died, and on autopsy, they figured out that she had an IVC clot or no, actually it was an iliac clot, and it eventually spread through the week that she repeatedly came in, and we had labeled her, even in her chart, it said pain. Um, you know, if we didn't mean to, even with the sickle cell patients, right, and we, we create policies that are reducing the amount of opiates we give them, but it's sickle cell, you know, policies, and then you have someone who maybe has a back pain of a different race, and they might be addicted to opiates too, but if you label it a sickle cell, you know, policy, then that really does create an institutional racism, right? Disparity, um, which is why for those of you who, you know, were a part of it, like I was pushing, like you cannot call this just for the sickle cell patients. It has to be for all chronic pain patients. Otherwise, we are perpetuating things that we don't want to. So we can't, you know, be devoid of it. We're not immune to it. But if you recognize it, 
human nature, but if you recognize it and try to address it, then, then you are the, the better because of it, you are the better position because of it. Um, but we all do it. Yeah, the, the us and them is a, is a powerful, powerful thing. And uh, growing up in the South, uh, it was, you know, it's all around you. Being cognizant of that is so, so. We're really lucky here in Brooklyn, in, in Kings County. You know, I think in medicine in general, we are kind of protected from the fact that you know, minorities and, and brown people don't necessarily make it to get to go to medical school, and we're you know over we're represented pretty very well here, and it's been exceptional, really beautiful. You talked about discrimination in housing and lending. There is this practice called redlining that's. Uh, that's talked about where um, <clears throat> lines were drawn of areas where only white people should be able to live versus minorities should be able to live. And it's actually been now shown to have great effects on healthcare outcomes and, and uh, disease patterns in neighborhoods as well. For example, things like asthma uh, exacerbations and uh, people who have like rheumatological diseases or skin conditions because of the, the types of environmental things, um, you know, dust in the air or close to certain types of power plants or other things like that. We're seeing a lot of changes. It was institutionalized in the practice of home lending that only certain people could get home loans or buy homes in certain areas. It was called red lines, so if you're interested in reading about it. It affects a lot of Brooklyn. Yeah. There's a really interesting documentary, too, that PBS just put out on the Reconstruction and what happened after the Civil War in the United States and all of the history of going up to Jim Crow and, and segregation in the South and then the Civil Rights Movement. It's a really beautifully done, like, four-piece documentary. And I really encourage you guys to watch it. It's really informative and eye-opening about things about our, our culture and history that not many of us get exposed to. Cool. Thank you guys. All right. We kind of rushed through the morning, so I think you all deserve a break. Let's take five to seven <coughs> minutes for a break and come back for uh, Dr. Resenti's presentation, OK? <laughs> but she, she's like an artist, she's doing this little more because they call it Yeah. 